Hi and welcome. My name is Laura Vash and I'm going to be the happy host of this special episode. Why is it special? Because we're preparing for the AI the Docs conference where Claire's uh, colleague Megan is going to present and I'm really happy to have this opportunity to talk with Claire. I'm really, really happy to welcome you, Claire, as my guest. Hello. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for having me. We're really excited that uh, Megan gets to present at AI the Docs and that I get to talk with you here about API the Docs and all things tech writing. You are joining today as your wonderful whole self, and you're also representing the uh, Cloudflare company where you are working as a lead of the product content experience team. Could you tell me a little bit about Cloudflare as your context where you work so that we understand where your answers for as per the last three years are coming from? Yeah, for sure. So Cloudflare is on a mission to help build a better internet. So that's kind of our, our mission that we put out there all the time. And we do that through having a, a globally distributed network of data centers. And we offer a variety of services and products that help the internet run faster, more reliably, and more securely. So things that range from like our cache and CDN products to firewall to the developer products that help people, you know, develop code more quickly and deploy it. Um, to zero trust things that help different workplaces stay secure. So we cover a really broad range of products, um, which is kind of an interesting position to be in as a tech writer. The product content experience team, of which I'm not the lead, that is our uh, my lovely manager, Kim Jeske, who oversees mm -hmm. all of our content. Um, but I do manage a team of the technical writers that support two of our key product areas. And so we have existed as a team for about three years really focused on making sure we have a um, really robust content strategy, how we help our users be successful, identifying what that user journey looks like through content and through our products, um, and really how we can help guide users to success. So it's a great team. We have a really great uh, variety of people on here. Um, our team is distributed across the EMEA. We have an office in Lisbon. We have a number of folks in London, in the UK, um, and then across the United States as well. So. Lots of interesting challenges in being both a globally distributed network and a globally distributed network of team members. That's the reality for a lot of us, I think, now. And where are you calling in from? It's morning for I, you. Yes, it is morning for me. I am in the Houston, Texas area. So I know Laura and I were talking before this. She is actually sitting next to a fireplace. I am sitting in a humid box because uh, Texas is warm and humid this time of year. No fireplace for me. And you're working at Cloudflare for three years now. Could you tell me a little bit of the journey? Yes, I have been at Cloudflare for three years. I did start as a technical writer. Um, so I started because that was the biggest need for the company. They needed technical writers. Here's where I started. And then as we got into the work, we were sort of realizing how much we needed to define our content strategy and have kind of that guiding vision for what we wanted out of the developer documentation. Uh, and then shortly after, I was talking with my manager about my career growth and kind of what my goals were and realized that... Um, if the opportunity came, I'd really like to transition into management. Um, I was lucky that that opportunity did, did come at Cloudflare. And so I've been in, manage, in a management role for almost three years now. And you're only acting as manager for technical writers or also other yes. disciplines? No, just technical writing. Um, so our team is big enough that we do have a, a separate manager that oversees our UX content strategists. So they're really looking at like our in-dash content and enabling users um, that are in the product itself. And it's what we really like is oftentimes you'll see UX designers or content designers sitting in like a, a product design org. We really love that connection of having them in the product content experience because then we get to kind of identify and define what the interaction looks like between what's in the dash and what's in our docs and making sure that the connection is really fluid and, and coherent throughout. So um, it's also fun because we have kind of fundamentally different ways of, of looking at content, but with the same shared goal of helping our users be successful. What are your key roles as a manager? What What is it that, that you say, I am a manager because I do that? Because I help people grow in their careers. I think that's like the biggest charter of all of it is you know, as technical writers, we're here because we do have products to support. So we're part of the product experience. We need to make sure we have really robust and, and um, comprehensive documentation to support the products that we're putting out there so that people understand how to use them. But in addition to like having to deliver docs and help enhance our product, I also am responsible for helping people identify opportunities to grow and learn what it means to be a technical writer, to find opportunities to do things that are engaging to them, um, that make them, you know, think that it's worth showing up to work for X number of hours a week to contribute something that's a little bigger than yourself. This area, it's improving so rapidly. 
uh, so many challenges and like I could <laughs> go into all the things you heard a million times already, but is it more that you have to find the opportunities or that you have to filter the opportunities of where to grow? You know, it, it really depends on the person. I think there's so many different opportunities. So something that I really love about technical writing is that it's very similar to some of the technical career paths. If you look at it in that you have so much runway to develop as a really high level, talented individual contributor, if that's what you want. Like if you don't have any interest in management and you're like, you know what? I really enjoy deep technical problems and helping users solve those and creating like, you know, really involved, meaty documentation. You have opportunities to do that, like in technical writing. There's so many things you can do. If you're more interested in like mentorship or management, oftentimes there are those opportunities as well as companies grow and change and, you know, companies' needs for what they need out of a, a group of technical writers change and grow as the company grows. So we really focus on hiring people that are interested in learning a lot, that they are kind of intrigued by technical details and getting their hands dirty and going in and exploring products. People that have a lot of user empathy, right, is you have to be very empathetic when you're when you're doing any tech writing job because you have to understand the challenges that your product and engineering stakeholders are dealing with. You have to understand the challenges your customers are dealing with and kind of navigate how to create content for that. But we also hire people who have a lot of initiative. They're very interested in going out and identifying challenges and then figuring out how to solve them. So with that, to answer your actual question, Laura, it's a lot of People are coming to us with problems constantly. Tech writers are like, hey, I'm noticing this thing and this thing. I think we can solve it this way in content. And oftentimes our job as a manager is to help prioritize which of those things we address because there's so many things you can do. Um, and we do have to support like the what we call run the business work of shipping product documentation. But also our job is to find those opportunities and improve the user experience wherever we can. So we hire people who are really interested in spotting those things. And oftentimes it's having to say, okay, we have so many hours in a day, which things are we going to do first and which ones are going to make the biggest impact for our customers? Tell me, how does the conversation sound like? So in hindsight, it's obvious where where you have your strengths, whether you want to be a uh, technical contributor or whether you want to be a people relationships contributor. But it's I think when you have to make that decision, if 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 the career path in the company is clearly forked, then in the beginning, it's not that easy. How how what what do you ask for a person from a person to to help them decide which is really their path? I'll admit that I don't manage managers yet, so this is not something I've had a, as much experience doing. But I have had experience choosing it myself, so I can totally uh -huh. speak to how we navigated those conversations. For me, a lot of it is where people get en their energy. If you get a lot of your energy in relationship building and talking to people and developing relationships and, um, you know, understanding somebody's point of view, I, I tend to realize that you probably are more interested in the maybe a management path long-term. Um, if you get a lot of energy from teaching somebody directly in person, if you get a lot of energy from like getting to know people on a personal level. The other thing is too, you do have to be comfortable giving direct feedback. Um, so if that's not something you enjoy doing face to face, that's not something you're probably you're probably not going to be very energized by a, a, a management role because that's kind of the reality of it is you have to help people grow in their careers, but also sometimes you have to deliver feedback that can be challenging, but you do it in a clear and kind way. So when I'm talking to people, you know, people that maybe choose to stay on an IC path really are still energized by talking to people, but it's more that there's a very concrete end goal. Is that like my goal of talking to you and then talking to engineering and talking to our users is to help have an input to my content and make it something that's going to be the best it can be for our people that are actually using that content. Whereas like the conversations you have in management are kind of continuous. It's not like a one time you have a conversation and you're done. It's a relationship that's building over time that you're constantly fostering and, and growing. So um, I yeah, I think it really comes down to like as a person, what do you enjoy doing in your in your work? And maybe that's when we have a conversation of maybe you're leaning towards management, maybe you're leaning toward mentorship, maybe you're leaning towards you know, like being a technical leader, content strategist. So yeah, a lot of it's asking questions of the people of just asking like, hey, what do you enjoy spending your time on? Why? And how do we find you more opportunities to do those things? Are you familiar with uh, Susan Kine's book, Quiet? The one for no, introverts? I I haven't read it, but um, I, I had an old colleague who was like, a, she staunchly said she was an introvert. And so she she really liked the concepts of the book because I think a lot of it is how to still 
lead even mm-hmm. when you have a more of an introvert personality, right? Mm-hmm. Because I believe stereotypically more introverts are present in, in a writing profession. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. But, you know, in some ways too, I think it, it, we're kind of an odd bunch because it's people that do enjoy that heads down work of writing, but you're, you're constantly put in situations where you have to either present about your own work and mm-hmm. like the value you're providing as a tech writer, or you have to interview others with more knowledge than you. So for people that maybe do have more uh, of an introverted, um, like personality, I find helping them find the tools to navigate those conversations with stakeholders helps make a really big impact. And where do you feel you are yourself on this path now? Like, so you've been at the current company for three years and you switched over to a um, clearly defined management track uh, and you work with technical writers um, in a, in a well moving product environment. Now, I don't like this word, but it is the best word. What is the challenge that you're dealing with right now in your role as becoming a better and better leader for people? I think finding ways to connect people to opportunities and then delegating. So when you're in a manager role, your success is measured by the success of your team, not by the success of the things that you output necessarily. Um, And so you'll see this in engineering and technical roles too, that they, they promote people that maybe have, were very like, effective ICs. And that works, but that doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be a really effective manager. And so that transition to from seeing the impact of your work as an individual and like those things that you're delivering and those those concrete projects and transitioning to your progress and your your success being how you're guiding other people to do that is really tough. That also means like delegating and, and handing off projects that I might have really wanted to keep and and help move forward because I know that like how important and how much of an impact it had for the business. Um, But for me to progress as a manager, I have to practice delegating those things to people so that they are then given those opportunities to shine and grow. So that's definitely the hardest bit is you feel a lot of ownership as a writer on your product, your space, or your platform, depending where you're positioned. And you have to start practicing delegation and know that your success is measured differently when you're in management. Do you feel it's different in technical writing profession than, for example, engineering? In how you're measured? In the things you have to learn so that you don't become petrified by the roles you've been pushed into, but that you learn to be better. I, I think it's a really, I think it's a, a universal experience for being a good manager. Good managers know when to release some control to their teams that they have opportunities to step in and develop. Um, if I were to keep every cool project that I had come across my desk or that I shared, that means that my team then isn't getting the opportunity to try new things and, and maybe expand into these new areas that would push them a little bit into uncomfortable places. So it's uncomfortable for me having to adjust to like delegating and sharing and passing it off to somebody else. And then it's a little maybe uncomfortable for them to stretch and learn how to do that new thing. Um, but at the end of the day, it's better for all of us because we're all learning and growing then. I asked you when we were meeting for the first time, um, it came up that one of your roles is wayfinding. And when it comes to AI tooling, it's not a clear thing what will be the consequences of one choice or another. Um, Everyone's still trying. It's, it's It's a shaping industry or practices. How do you do that? So I'm leading you towards something very specific that you told me that you use a methodology in making choices together with your team. Yeah, so um, we are, so I think what you're referring to is the coins methodology, mm-hmm. right, Laura? Yeah, so um, that one we use a bit for giving, for providing feedback. So for those of you who haven't been exposed to it before, coins is context, observation, impact, and next step. So when you're giving feedback to somebody, it's saying, in this situation, I noticed this behavior, this is the impact it has, and how do we move forward? So how do we have a plan to move forward? Um, I, you did hit an AI tooling, though, and I think the really interesting place about like when we're, our environment as tech is, is changing, right? Is we're constantly having new developments in the tech that we're able to use to deliver our docs. And um, you have probably have all heard like, well, like, aren't you worried about AI taking your job? Uh, and so what we, what we do is apply like the coins and say, hey, you know, in this situation, we're noticing that this technology is available. 
maybe as tech writers, we're feeling uncomfortable with it. So how do we move forward? For us as a team, that was, let's actually elevate the importance of trying out these AI tools. So when we were establishing our objectives for this year, we said, you know what, we're going to actually make an objective around embracing AI to help improve our team's efficiency. Um, And so to address the situation of us maybe feeling a little discomforted about what's happening with AI and content and what that means, um, let's come up with some next steps, which is we're going to explore it. We're going to go in, try to use AI ourselves, see if there's opportunities that we can use to like leverage AI in our own processes, um, and then maybe share them externally if, if they're valuable. Is it okay if I talk a little bit about some of the projects that we're, we're looking at, Laura, for AI? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Please. Okay. So um, I am just, again, like you're a manager, your role is to like cheer on your team and everybody else around you. Um, some of the things that we're doing is uh, we've had a couple of folks looking at um, how to use just AI to help improve our processes. So we have somebody developing a really cool tool that takes um, UI content and API content and based on the criteria that we've established, um, gives it a grade. So it's like says, hey, you know, based on these criteria, we've like weighted. So, you know, some of it's like uses active tense and maybe um, is le- like leading with the user action that they're going to take and avoids passive voice and sentences, things like things like that. Um, this tool, you, like it runs its model, suggests some improve, like gives it a grade and then suggests some concrete improvements. So for us as writers, you know, we, we, our time is, we support products, but are, we're not able to spend time on every single piece of content that gets created. And so it's creating a tool so that then other teams can maybe use this and improve their own. That really helps out for API descriptions, for example. Another thing we're doing is how do we introduce like an AI assistant into a subset of our documentation that's really important for our customers to use as a whole and use the AI assistant to guide people to answers. So yeah, that's those are a couple of the projects that we're exploring. And then just like totally low stakes to get people more comfortable with AI. We're trying to do an adventures in AI challenge every month. So we have a weekly team time where we just get together and uh, kind of chat about life and just whatever's on our minds. And we're repurposing one of those a month or every few weeks, I think, to do some sort of activity with either AI or the API. And our last one was we split into teams. Each team used a different um, AI assistant and came up with a list of 10 like pub trivia style questions. And then we swapped questions and saw how the the other, like the other chatbots did with that the other chatbots questions. So just stuff to kind of increase comfort. So going all the way back to coins, the context and observation was that people were feeling kind of uncomfortable with the idea of AI. And the next steps we took were, well, let's kind of address that. Let's come up with projects and activities to help us um, feel more comfortable with those things. The other role next to wayfinding is to align other stakeholders, to bring in all the other stakeholders, say marketing, um, and produce things that are serving all of these stakeholders' needs. Do you have strong voices in your AI tooling choices? So we actually, uh, yes, because we are we offer a set of developer tools. And so we're actually developing a, um, a an AI platform that allows you to engage with AIs and different models. Um, it's called Workers AI and more on that in a couple of weeks. But uh, so we have people that are really invested in like trying out all the different ones which means that we, it's a little less from like the marketing and kind of cross-functional stakeholders and more from our technical stakeholders of saying, hey, you should go check out this model or check out this assistant and figure out how we can apply it to our workflow or or our our customers, um, the way the customers engage with us. So um, I'm not sure that I totally answered your question, Alor. I was interested in what way do you bring in the decisions to technical writing when other interests are pushing what you do, how you do. For example, you made the decision to open source your docs. Where did that come from and how how and why? And what was the pro and a contra? And what is the benefit that you're seeing now? Yeah, um, I think that decision actually predated all of us. Um, so we sort of inherited the idea. But um, I think the philosophy of it was that we have a really, we're really lucky at Cloudflare to have a super engaged user base. So we have people that really like our products and really like providing feedback about our products too. Um, and so just to kind of show that we were really developer focused, they built the developer documentation, where, which is where we publish most of our content. Um, 
in GitHub as a repo and you're able to open PRs on it as anybody that's using it. Um, it does make it challenging to, you know, prioritize against all the feedback sometimes, but overall it's stuff that our users are noticing and suggesting improvements to. So, so from a balancing that and like the decisions that kind of led to that point, um, we didn't really have to do. We kind of just inherited it and said, you know what, I re recognized how good it's been for our docs um, and why it's just so valuable for us to, to kind of keep iterating and constantly changing our docs based on the user input we're getting. For other things about like balancing when our technical stakeholders or other stakeholders have pretty strong opinions, it's just taking everything back to the user journey. So what is best for our users? What's going to lead them to success? What's their workflow, both with our products and outside of our products, so that we're kind of leading people into solutions um, and success? And so when you kind of make it about the user journey, it sort of removes any, it removes most strong opinions if you can like very clearly state like, hey, this is how people are progressing. This is the best thing that's going to be best. It doesn't matter my opinion or your opinion or who's right. It's what's best for our user. Mm -hmm. uh, last June in Amsterdam, your colleagues, uh, Greg and uh, Nevi, were giving a presentation about um, how to get to that first moment of yay. Uh, they called it the, the first uh, time to first dopamine, uh, which had a very strong um, positive uh, echo from especially uh, product owners in the room. They really liked that expression. And um, so uh, your colleagues were talking about the specific learning pathways where uh, they lead your users through um, specific use cases and they put a lot of emphasis, uh, emphasis on the interactivity to, to engage people while they are learning, that they can try things out, that this onboarding is very, very important psychologically to have a good, strong base for actually using things later. Do you have a lot of opinions flying around the room about that or this is already consensus proven? You know, it, it kind of varies. We we have a lot of different product areas and the um, the primary user of some of those products is different. So um, I think Greg and Nevi's products um, are in our developer platform. And so those are ones that they know developers really want to be like trying things out, testing, seeing how it's working, getting that like initial yay moment, I think is what they call them and uh, making sure that things are working as expected. Whereas like some of our other products maybe are more focused on larger, uh, you know, a large business environment where they wanna make sure things work before they like deploy it to their their internal users. For example, I'm thinking about like, we have some products that secure uh, how people work uh, with um, internal workplace resources, for example, like, you know, a wiki and, and Jira tickets and things like that. Um, and so what, what's nice though, is that both sets of those users or both sets of those stakeholders are really invested in making sure we're creating resources that are based on the user's actual scenario um, and building content around that. So I think maybe this is just like a, an, I don't know if it's a maturity of tech writing org or just something that happens as you have more people in time. But I feel like our, our baseline for the first bit of time was let's just document the product and what it's doing because we didn't have that. And we needed to do that. And then over time, we kind of got that down and it was more stable and, and reliable. And then we started building on, okay, what kind of troubleshooting information do people need? How do we layer that in and expand on that to make sure that like when they follow instructions that are still having trouble, here's the common things we see them struggling with. And now that we feel like that's still evolving, but you know, we pretty we know what we need to do there. It's how do we build these customer, you know, the jobs to be done framework is a, is a way of looking at this is like, what is their actual goal uh, as a user? What are they trying to accomplish? And then how do we structure and craft documentation to help them achieve that particular goal? And sometimes that means moving beyond just product documentation. It means connecting our products together in a way that's going to make sense for that user. And during this journey of evolution, if you allow me to call me that, did you change the fundamental architecture in any at any step? I think we're kind of in that stage right now. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we sort of, it feels like we need to cater to both, right? Is we need people that, we need to create documentation for the product. Like we need to make sure that the product is, documentation itself is reliable and consistent and um, guides people to like to success within that like process. 
Um, and so like that still exists. We still have product buckets with within the product. It's like a, a consistent information architecture within that. Um, what we're sort of doing more of now is drawing those maps of like, let's assume that you're using more than one of our products because most of our users are. How do we build a curated content experience for you for the way that you're using our products together? Um, we've got pockets of it. And what that looks like is a new section of our documentation where we do have like specifically structured um, like kind of journeys. We're calling those learning paths and then also implementation guides. So depending on kind of what you're trying to do, that's the language we're using for those. So they're, they're sort of both experiences are still existing in our docs. And it's something that we're, we're kind of figuring out, okay, well, as we evolve as a, as a company and as, as a docs team, what does that look like moving forward and how do we have those experiences coexist or, you know, maybe one elevates over another. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's the interesting part. Like um, in, in Stripe, they have recently implemented the middle layer, which was an interesting decision. Um, when you, when you mark a set of documents as learning path, um, is that enough of a tag so that people's expectations going into that is shifted towards, okay, I'm on a path which I'm expected to follow, to learn? So we, the way that we've highlighted those is usually from linking out to them from the product doc too. So mm -hmm. our, our product documentation is interesting in that we have some content that is very specifically for a single product and then other places where it's more for a platform that's like a bunch of products used together, but the docs are structured the same. So that's kind of like a Maybe this isn't the right way. We need to revisit that decision, but that is our reality right now. Um, and we link out to those learning paths from within those spaces so that when in the context of like the product you're in, when you go out to the learning path, you're, if, you're, if that's your journey to the learning path, you are, you're kind of very consciously saying, okay, I'm going into a learning space where I'm being walked through and guided through. Um, if you come into it separately, I don't know the answer to that, Laura. That's some, a good place for us to do some user research, I think, is how did you get here? Did this align with your expectations? And if not, do we give you the escape hatch to go to the product documentation that you may have been looking for? Mm -hmm. What kind of user personas are usually um, giving you very positive feedback on this learning path? Who's using them? Yeah, we're, um, we're seeing a lot of people we're actually seeing a lot of internal users use them because we're stitching the product together to in a way that maybe they haven't been um, had resources to support them for. Um, but a lot of people that are coming in and trying to deploy our products um, is kind of what we're noticing. So the, the feedback we've gotten is for people that are trying to understand how to use this product, these products together. Um, and our, our user personas are pretty broad. We have a, a variety of them. Um, and so it's not like just developers or just like network admins. It, it could be a, a variety of different folks. Um, but usually it's people that are trying to come in and set up and deploy a product uh, and make sure that they're doing it in the best way for them. So mm -hmm. that that's kind of what we're seeing. We haven't seen a whole lot of um, our GitHub feedback on the learning paths yet. So we're, we're kind of asking ourselves, is that because we're maybe not highlighting those as much, or maybe we need to actually just promote that those exist in more places? Um, we're about to release a series of, of new ones for one of our focus areas. And so I think um, we'll kind of learn more about who's actually using them once we publish that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, question, have you encountered problems with content redundancy in this context, both in terms of reading experience and for the maintenance? Yeah, so um, I came from a, a workplace where we used use Dita, which was really great for this kind of thing, right? As content reuse, and you could like reuse it in multiple places. Um, with our content creation happening mostly in Markdown and then through GitHub, uh, we're really leaning heavy into partials for this. So like creating partial files that you can reuse within the product documentation and the learning path. Um, the nice part is like we are still, there our, our content team is still the ones primarily creating learning paths and the product docs. So we know when content's redundant between the two because the same writer, the same group of writers is creating those. Mm -hmm. So if somebody suggests content, they can say, oh, that actually already exists. Let's just repurpose that into a partial or some way that we can reuse it and pull it into the learning path. Um, so we do it that way. We also do it by um, linking out. So sometimes within the learning path, like we'll have some contextual 
information for what you're trying to do. And then we'll link you back into the product documentation for the actual how to do it. Do you see a a ceiling where you know that you have to refactor? I think we're kind of reaching it right now for what it's worth. And it, it it's, it's a bit that I think we're feeling that because our products have just evolved and the way that we're kind of trying to position our products as a company is becoming more of like a cohesive platform than a one stop, like a pick and choose your own adventure. So mm-hmm. I, I think we're kind of in that inflection point and we're do, we're supporting it right now by having both experiences and, and enabling both experiences. Um, what that looks like for like positioning the value of our team to stakeholders is, hey, you, you've always needed product documentation. You're seeing the value of doing these learning paths and implementation guides and kind of like journey style content. For us to keep doing both, we're going to need more investment in our team so that we can hire more people to, to do this. Or we need to stop doing one of these things. Um, so, and then it becomes a discussion about priority and what what the people's goals are. Um, we've been really lucky in that most of our stakeholders have, been, have said, well, you need both. So we've been able to keep doing both. But um, for example, some of these implementation guides that we're, we're releasing soon, we started working on in December and we're just now getting around to releasing them because the, the technical... Um, the technical knowledge, the process of actually like putting together something really opinionated and guided and comprehensive, it just takes a lot of time. Um, we're really hoping that we'll be able to prove the value of doing that, but um, it's a it's a big investment. And so you have to kind of have stakeholders that are willing to, to bet on you uh, doing it and willing to bet that it's going to make an impact. Did you bump into the, ah, oh, now the AI bots are going to answer all those questions based on the product? Of course we did, Laura. Of course we did, which is where like the nice things about it. You've seen some different technical writing companies kind of come out with that. Like the basics of good technical writing are going to be really helpful for AI consumption. Um, and also if we create this sort of stitched together journey already, then the AI can consume that and provide good natural language answers to a user. So actually what we're doing is sort of like giving the AI maybe the the best <laughs> the best journey to recommend to a user. So by having really good clear product documentation, which I feel like are like kind of the, the building blocks. And then that other layer of the journey, any AI that will consume that will hopefully be informed enough to understand which pieces to pull together and how. Um, that is obviously risk in that, right? As AIs like to hallucinate and they like to kind of pull things together in their own ways. And so that's kind of our our challenge now is how do we make sure that the ones we create don't do that and only do things and recommend things based on how we want it to. Um, but yeah, that when everyone's like, hey, just throw it all in one doc and the AI will sort through it and give you a good that's answer. True. Yeah, yeah, it's not true. <laughs> uh, does this challenge pull you closer um, to collaborate with the engineers and and um, do you have any best practices for this? Yeah, have you know, and it's not it's not just engineering. Yeah, I, I think it's it's more than just engineering for us. It's it's our customer success and customer solutions teams. It's our customer support teams. It's our product teams, um, and just finding the people who really understand the challenges that customers are having. Um, we're doing that by pulling them in as you know technical validators, as people that can provide some examples of user scenarios. Um, from getting engineering and then put that looks like having them validate that what we've written is technically accurate and what we want to communicate. Um, so yeah, in, in having to pull together these kinds of like learning paths and implementation guides, we have to know how people are actually using our products, which means that we have to either talk to customers or we have to talk to the people closest to customers. Um, and so we've been building those relationships on our team um, of saying, hey, you know, we're coming, we have something that we think would be valuable for you as in your role internally that would help you better support customers. If you spend a little bit of time with us now, you can use this thing that we create together to support, you know, countless customers moving forward. Um, and that argument's usually been really effective of spend a little time with tech writing and, and, content, and UX content strategy now, um, and it'll pay off big time for you later. What is the shining successes that you can pull out from the top of your head in your moments at Cloudflare? Oh, man. Um, mm-hmm. I think sh- anything where we've shipped something that we've tried for the first time and done together. So 
Well, I, I keep mentioning an implementation card because we're very much in the throes of, of that to ship one. And that's been a really cl- cross collaborative project with two of the technical writers, with a um, somebody on our sales side, and then with a couple of the uh, product stakeholders. And just that that sense of knowing you're all in it together to create something that's going to help the users be successful is really rewarding. Because um, I'm getting to watch two of the folks on my team, you know, step into spaces and try things that maybe they hadn't before and then deliver something that's also going to be beneficial to the user. I think those kinds of projects, I can't, I can't pick just one. It's kind of hard. But also, I guess early on, we had to establish the content strategy for Cloudflare in, in technical writing. Um, and that was really cool because as a team, we got together, we did a series of workshops to say, okay, what's the purpose of this? Like, what's this content type that we need to create? What's its purpose? What's its template? How do we, how do we create it? Um, and now that's the template we use for everything. So that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to see like the thing that we did at the beginning being a good instinct that's now carrying us forward. We're having to evolve it. We've changed the the templates need to change, but um, it's cool to see that that was the right choice early on. Yeah, it's really good to see a vector taking off. Have you, this is a question from uh, Sika Zoltan. Uh, have you considered using AI to know what part of the product documentation needs updates? Yeah, that's a really good question. We've been kind of exploring um, like what criteria to tell us that something maybe hasn't been updated in a while or is out of date. Um, things that we've we've sort of been starting to explore is how do we use any sort of AI validation, like to, to validate the accuracy of the steps? Like, is there a way that we could have a bot or something run through what we've written on a periodic basis and tell us whether it is out of date? So like, that's a very interesting thing. Um, in the same way that you'd use different analytic criteria to decide whether to go back and update something, doing the same thing with an AI, right? It's like assess everything that's in our repo, say last updated date, last, you know, major update date based on a set of criteria um, and and kind of re- revisit whether it needs to be refreshed. So yeah, I think there's some really interesting potential projects there that we're just sort of the beginning stages of exploring. And I have, uh, before closing, a bit of a more personal, oh, there's one more question. Are there any specific features or capabilities that you anticipate becoming standard? in the future documentation platform. Yeah, I think I think you're going to see a really close integration with other other AI assistants um, because there's such an appetite for them. So whether that's developing your own, which I don't know that we all need to go develop our own chatbots for our docs, that doesn't necessarily seem like the best use of time, or just inter- making sure that we're really well integrated with certain models so that when those models consume your content, you can say you can have faith that it's going to give the right answer, and then guiding people maybe to that particular model or assistant that you're you're trying to encourage. So I don't know that it'll necessarily look like every you know when everybody was every single company was like going and creating their own app. It's like I don't know that's going to look like that for AI assistants, but maybe it'll just be like a a better relationship between companies and a particular model, so that the way you're you're structuring the docs and structuring your content is maybe best consumed by a particular AI. The um, upcoming AI the Docs conference, uh, we were specifically selecting uh, some of the talk proposals to help show how how a large documentation set or a small one can prepare for this. This I always was waiting for this flow experience on the internet rather than still hitting up the phone book just digitally. Um, and I hope that's coming, but that means that that the the, the information sets have to be ready for that consumption. Yeah, and this is the thing that I think is is a nice part about if you've done good structured technical writing, you're already preparing for AI consumption. You know, AIs look for, you know, structured, repeatable content. So having a content strategy that uses the same formatting is a really good thing for a search engine or an AI assistant. Having uh, metadata in describing what the content is, using clear, concise language, um, you know, and an access that's written really accessibly and straightforward. Um, you know, things that like kind of guide you to success and have cross-linking so you kind of know where to go in your journey as, as you're on a piece of content. So all those things we kind of already have to do for good SEO, it's remain true for, for chatbots too. My question, your background in journalism, where do you see that coming back? In asking questions. I think, um, I think, I think, you know, in, in, so I, I did under an undergraduate degree in journalism and worked in kind of like magazine journalism for a little bit, uh, travel magazine journalism. And 
it's building relationships with people to get the information you need to. And I don't want that to sound like it's, um, I, I don't know, it's not like a negative. It's it's just to kind of learn, right? Is you're, you're building relationships to learn something. And for, for journalism, that's like to be able to write a story about the thing they're doing or to understand their perspective. And for technical writing, that's to be able to get the information you need to um, write about the product. And for management, that's to get the information from your uh, the people on your team about like what their goals and hopes are and, and what they enjoy doing and what they don't. So um, I think a lot of it just goes back to asking questions, um, open-ended questions that that aren't yes or no's that kind of do encourage more um, details and response. So yeah, and then also research. I think you know that's an underrated skill from from for technical writers is being able to go in and kind of understand things yourself and do that level of research. But by and large, the how to ask a good questions um, to get the information you're looking for is the skill I use most for my journalism background. Working in this space and having an understanding of the magnitude of what is going to change and what can possibly go wrong. How do you navigate that as a parent? Yeah. And so like you, uh, you sort of kind of feel like you're constantly on high alert, right? As you're you're looking at all the things that can possibly happen in all the different ways that your two year old could run off the stairs, or your your person could go accidentally have a bad interaction with an engineer or a senior stakeholder. Um, all you can do is prepare your people. You know whether that's like preparing the people on my team for a variety of scenarios based on the stakeholders they're working with and the projects they're supporting. Whether that's like as a parent, you know, helping guide my kids to learn and grow and avoid, hopefully avoid the bad situations as much as they can. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, I find things from parenting really helping with the way I manage and things from management really helping with the way I parent. Um, and a lot of that comes to just being empathetic, um, understanding the situation that somebody's dealing with um, and helping uh, and asking questions to help kind of navigate to solutions, whether that's Again, like my two-year-old having to tie her shoes or um, a, a, a direct report having to navigate a tough situation. So you think that we are going to have to have like sort of incident management scenarios when it comes to your uh, running with an AI bot? Uh, yeah, probably, right? Is like we'll have to make sure that we are sort of kind of anticipating what could go wrong and coming up with plan A, B, C, and D to, to mitigate that sort of an, an overarching message that you would like people to sit with after they leave this uh, conversation? Yeah, I think originally we had uh, sort of intended to say like, you know, API docs and things take a lot of iteration and you're constantly changing. I think that actually holds really true for being a person working as well. You know, I at one point was pretty convinced I was going to stay on an, on an IC track and sort of really just grow as a content strategist and, and, and business leader in that way and realize that, no, I actually really enjoy kind of managing people and helping them be guided towards solutions and, and success too. Um, so that was a change in me and my goals. Um, as you're looking at your own career and kind of what you want, knowing that in the same way that your docs are never done, if they're open source or supporting a product, your career or your, what you want is never done, right? And for people, we're constantly changing and evolving. Um, and that's not only okay, it's expected. Like you shouldn't be stagnant your whole life. You're going to change and evolve, even if it's just by nature of like what's changing around you. Um, and so, yeah, I think the the iteration not being just for docs, it's iteration for for ourselves too and giving ourselves grace to explore new things and try new things when the opportunities arise. Thank you very much, Claire. It was a joy to have you as a guest and I'm looking forward to meeting you later on. Thank you so much, Laura. This is fun. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website, api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.